what are slash is raps slash rap acronyms only right so this is your job now you got about a few minutes acronyms are you take the word <laughs> I'm very fundamental you take each letter in the word and then you put another, you make a letter out of that, a word out of that letter that describes the word, the original word, the source word. Let me know when you got a good one, like a real good one. And then you can like stand up and blurt it out. In a disciplined way, but think, think through it. Think about it deeply. I want you to reflect aggressively. I want you to penetrate subconsciously and really think about it. What are raps? What is rap? All right? Give it like another minute to stew. Doc, you find you. This is familiar to you, Doc Ati. Hey, guys. Welcome. I need you to come up with an acronym for rap or raps. You can pick. Uh, Not now. You can just. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa there, cowboy. Hold on. All right. That's eight. OK. Who we got? I think we got one over here. <laughs> That's how we're putting people on blast. Come on. Uh, riffs and poetry. Ooh. Riffs and poetry. OK. Let's, let's do a whole Real ass people. <laughs> OK. Let's, uh, let's, do, let's do the newcomer. Hey. Well, I mean, the thing is, mine was rhythm and poetry. I'm trying to, I'm trying to pick up. Okay, so you you biting styles already? I see. Um, Doc I T. Real anger people stay. <laughs> rhythm and people. Rhythm and people. Rooted autobiographies pronounced. Rooted autobiographies pronounced. Uh huh. Nice. Cowboy, what's up? I just wanted to give yeah, it yeah. up. Okay. Uh, realizations and passions. Realizations and passions. E. Let me just randomly point. Real ass perspectives. Real ass perspectives. Okay, it's a lot of ass in the room. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm biasing to ass. But we'll take it. Right. Rhymes and pacing. Rhymes and pacing, yeah. Rhythmic access to people's souls. Rhythmic oh. access to people's oh. souls. Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's utterly beautiful. <laughs> Deep and meaningful. Um, Mary Fuller. Righteous artistic performance. Righteous artistic performance. Jeez, Pete. This is great. D1, my brother. Rebellious artistic poetry. Hey. Hey, anybody else want to throw their last? Everybody's welcome. Running after purpose. Running after purpose. I like that. Shut up. Well, one was kind of already said. I said rhymes, rhymes and pace. Rhyme and pace. Yep. Mine is the bass. B a s s. Beats and stories. Fun. You know that's not rap, right? <laughs> <laughs> do you play the bass? Is that why you did that? No. OK. All right, all right. That's unaccepted, just FYI. Um, we enjoy it. Ian Kondry. Rare artistic power and style. Hey, rare artistic power and style. OK. Cowboy, did you have another one? No? OK. I think about this constantly. 
and I'm constantly revising and setting new rules about how the acronym should be developed. The original acronym that we started at SOSA and built SOSA, Society of Spoken Art, upon uh, was rhetorical, anthropological, philosophical structures. And then we created an entire curriculum about investigating that particular definition of rap. Um, the most recent one that I had was relationships, associations, parallels, and well, I can't say the other. I can't say the S. We'll leave it at that, because that's, that comes through later. While I was here, mm, maybe a month ago, I came up with these. Recognizing analogous patterns, maybe reconciling adversarial patterning, and just goes on and on and on and on and on, right? Constantly revising, constantly being dynamic, right? Because that's what rap deserves. It deserves constant attention, constant focus, constant alteration, right? Constant changing in the face of new ventures, new places, new spaces, new ideas, new generations, as they take it and make it what it means to be for them, right? But it's also really, really sexy, I think, right? This idea of defining it by its own structures, what's already there, right? Not trying to go too far out and make it something that it's not. Like, can we define it within its own terms? And then what is the process to get to that, right? What happens when you do that to your name, right? What, do you happen, what happens when you do that with your job description? What, do you hap what happens when you do that to your belief systems? What is the mechanisms and the tools and what changes, right? So it, it's meant to constantly be defined. And then dug into, right? What does it mean to reconcile adversaries? What does it mean to be righteously aggressive? What does it mean to, to base, you know, to be based. <laughs> Cooking day. So, shapes and details, right? Sometimes we get this confused when we talk about rap, right? I like to keep things very fundamental, very simple, very basic. We can get complex later. We're already complex. That's the problem. Too complex, right? We need to dumb it down going over people's heads and dumb down. Um, and I like to do it, this is very, to me this is very clean, right? The metaphor or the analogy would be bodybuilders, right? If you want to become a bodybuilder, first thing you have to do is get into shape, right? Just a general shape, a general, general workable shape. Right? Big exercises. Just do some squats. Just do some bench presses. Right? Just big exercises. Then as you start to want to get your pro card, you got to get into the details. Right? Little five pound little joints. But you just do this little thing right here to get this little part right here to just pop a little bit. Right? Get into these details. Right? Shapes and details. Right? Big, big ideas, big, big concepts, then how do we execute through those concepts, right? How do we filter through and come on and get the details, right? And they play off each other. You got to have both. You can't just be super duper detail oriented with no shape, right? You can't just have shape all the time with no details, right? If you want to be subjectively good, but even objectively good, right? Because this is happening whether you want to or not. You're playing with shapes, primal, big primes. You're playing with these little, small things. Shapes and details, to keep it really basic. To get a little bit more precise, this is my favorite word in rap. 
Did you notice where it was in rap? Because I put it there. <laughs> Use it all the time. Micro decisions, right? Your details. We'll get into what these are. A couple. Micro decisions may consist of stretching or extending specific vowels in words to achieve or regulate certain tones, moods, or temporalities, right? So you don't have to do all of this, oh, I need this, this punchline. I need this, I need that. Like, no, I need you to put a little bit more stress. Lay on that O. So it goes, oh, did you behold what I did? Right? I need that ah and what to be very quick. Right? So behold feels like this. How do you do that in words? We have to say, behold. Right? Seems silly. It won me a Grammy. Right? <laughs> right? Seems, seems like, ah, uh, that's nothing. So millions of records. Millions. Maybe millions of dollars. <laughs> Cars, jewelry. It's ridiculous. <laughs> what you could do with stretching vowels. Right? That one simple tool, that one simple micro decision. Right? And you can just play with it all day. You sit with words and say, oh, I'm going take, to take the word itself, micro decision, micro decision. Right? Well, I'm going to do micro decision. OK. All right. I got, I got my. I got where I want to put my stresses on my vowels, right? And now I'm going to go write this verse, right? I already got the shape. I already know what I'm going to talk about. But now let me get into these details, work on these micro decisions. And there's more. There's a list, but we don't have time. Macro decisions, big shit, right? Big old things, the big ideas, right? The big shapes. We're going to dive deep into this, this next one. One of the best macro decisions, and what I've been studying here on the research side since I've been at MIT, has been studying, surprise, <laughs> right? Surprise is one of the fundamental, primal pieces of life. I just rap of life. Bullshit, right? I can make the claim that everything you learned was by surprise. In one way or another, right? It's to kind of crept up on you. One plus one is two. Oh, shit, one plus one. Right? You didn't know before, you know it now. What's the mechanism to get it, to traverse that distance, that gap? It's probably surprise. Right? But let's go deep. You ready? Ready to get deep? Ready to go to class? Check this out. That's right, I, I read white papers and I cite. <laughs> Surprises not only influence individuals' attention, learning, memory, attitudes, and behavior, they can also have larger scale social influences. This is because people seem to be interested and sharing surprises with others. Who shared the meme today? Who shared the video today? Right? What, what's the word? I give you $2, not in real money, <laughs> but in Lupe dollars. If you tell me what's one of, the, one of the, the phrases that we always see, one of the common phrases that we see in videos being posted on social media? Huh? Hmm? Viral? Yeah, yeah. But we don't really see this is, this is viral. Like, what do we see in the comment section, the description? OMG. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
watch till the end. Right? Or wait for it. What is that? Wait for it. Right? Share that. Right? It goes viral. Because you see that one thing and then you like, she's like, Bye! Right? You know that one? Look at you surprised. He's like, she was surprised that I knew that, didn't you? But it is right? You're laughing. How many times did you watch it? Yeah? Bye! Bye! Right? Didn't expect that little girl to do that. I watched that shit so many times, it was crazy. <laughs> right? And there's others. Like, what's gonna happen? Bye! Right? Stories with surprising elements tend to degrade and change less as they are passed along than stories without surprising elements. That's surprising, ain't it? <laughs> right? How does Lupe Fiasco persist this long? People can't believe it, right? I don't talk about sex. I don't talk about gun. I don't talk about any of that. I kind of do, but I don't. <laughs> I want to really bad. It's just littered with little surprises. Little landmines of, whoa, that, oh. Bars that you don't get until like five years later when you're watching some random cartoon from Turkmenistan, maybe. Like, who hey, like, oh, oh, right. They sustain, they're stable, right? Ain't that what we want in careers, right? Isn't that kind of the essence of longevity, right? Doesn't degrade? How do we get to that? Maybe through surprise. Here's another one. I got them all day. Surprising information has been shown to impact what we remember and to facilitate transfer of learning strategies. Inducing an uncertain mood like surprise has been found to lead to more systemic processing, which might aid learning. What does rap do all day? You know how much shit I learned from rap? I learned how to buy Rolexes from rap. Did you know Rolex is a 501c3? That's a non-for-profit. I didn't learn that from rap, but <laughs> surprise, right? I bring that up not lightly. Rap teaches a lot. It's one of the most ultimate teaching tools. It teaches you how to dance, it teaches you how to dress, it teaches you how to talk, it teaches you how to walk teaches you how to think. It's ridiculously, ridiculously capable, right? It can also teach you how to kill people, teach you how to sell drugs, teach you how to die, teach you how to go to prison, right? It teach you how to survive in prison. It can teach you, how, it can teach you politics, right? It teach you who to vote for. It's a teaching tool, right? How many people intentionally use it as that? How many people just do it for fun? How many rappers in here? For fun, right? For money? Money and fun, there we go, right? He didn't say teaching. Because unfortunately, most rappers don't know how, right? We live by a phrase at Sosa that rappers know how to do it, but they don't know what they're doing. Because rap was never formally trained. It was never put into an institution. And all of these things like this, you didn't have to take a test to become a rapper. Your test was, does it work at the strip club? Which is the Atlanta formula. For real. Does it work at the strip club? That is the test for rap. I don't care how you got there, but can you have that effect? Can you teach strippers to dance? Right? That it has its place. 
right? But rap has so much potential, right? So if you come to the class, you're going to be doing this shit. We're, not gonna have, we're gonna have some fun, I'm gonna make it fun, but we're gonna be doing this. That's a warning to the students out there who thought you was finna be in here making strip club music with Lupe Fiasco. <laughs> we're gonna be reading white papers about surprisal and then teaching you how to do that with intention. So you can really elevate the power of the craft. Right? And really use it as a teaching thing. Because if you do it successfully, guess what? My man's. You'll make more money and have more fun. Because you'll have more followers. Because more things will go viral. You create deeper relationships, associations, parallels, and surprises. Right? Here's another one. Surprise! We still on surprise. Surprise is evoked just to give you a little sense of what it is, right? That stuff was kind of descriptive. This is what it is, how it works. Surprise is evoked by unexpected schema discrepant events. And its intens intensity is determined by the degree of the schema di discrepancy, right? How far off is this from normality for you, right? That's how big the surprise is. Unexpected events cause an automatic interruption of ongoing mental processes that is followed by an intentional shift and intentional binding to the events. It's like, oh, what is that? Oh, what's that? Right? Which is often followed by causal and other event analysis processes and by schema revision. Schemas are kind of worldviews, kind of conceptual frames, cognitively how you view the world, how you pursue through it. Right? and run after purpose. Right? You do that in certain ways and certain paths based on what your kind of fundamental schemas are. But these schemas are constantly being changed as you interface with different types of information and different types of experiences, people's places. Right? So that's why you have to be careful what you listen to. Be careful who you listen to and where you go. Because unconsciously, your brain is changing. Right? And not necessarily your neurons or like neuroplasticity and stuff like that, that happens, but on the front end, just the way that your schemas change. Right? Story time, repetition, break, plot, structure. Here's a tool of how you can use surprise. Let's bring it back down to earth. Let's come out the white papers. Right? Let's take it to the streets. Are you in a gang? You. You. You in a gang? No? Okay. I'm just asking if you was in a gang. You got a lot of blue there. I'm just making sure. <laughs> <laughs> nice sweater. I like it. Thank you. Don't wet that out west, though. You know. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Shh, shh, shh. Once upon a time, Three little pigs. First pig builds his house out of straw. The big bad wolf comes. He says, I'll huff and I'll puff. Little pig, little pig, let me in. Little pig says, not by the hell am I. <laughs> right? Wolf is like, yo, I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. And he goes, blows his house down, right? So that little pig runs to his, his other homie's pig's house, right? Which is made out of uh, sticks and little pig, little pig, let me in, not by the hair on my, that's the call and response, see the power of story? See how I just made you do that? Why did you do that? Right? I've been in front of millions of people that I've never met before and had them doing all kinds of things. Right? Consciously, unconsciously, this is what to be. That's power. Be careful, rappers.
I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. He huffs, he puffs, he blows, house down, right? Those two little pigs go to the third pig's house. His house is made out of? No, it's made out of a carbonite material. Right? <laughs> At least here at MIT, it would be made out of that. we made out of nuclear energy or something like that. Um, but it's made out of bricks. And he knocks. Little pigs, little pigs, let me in. Not by the hell am I. Y'all still saying it. Why? Oh, dude, we got a ooh. Jazzy. No, I'll huff and I'll puff. I'll blow your house down. He blows, he blows, he blows. What happens? Repetition break. Plot structure is what happened. There's a break in the repetition. Right? First pig did a thing, wolf did a thing, that thing happened. You're like, all right, cool. Chinny, chin, chin. Right? Next thing, pigs do a thing, wolf does a thing, thing happens, same thing happens. Chinny, chin, chin. Right? Go to the third one, oh. They do a thing, they do a thing. Surprise, nope, can't blow on these bricks. Right? Repetition, break, plot, structure. Where have we seen this? Who's seen this? I know you've seen this. Everybody's seen this. Who's seen this in rap? Verse hook, verse hook, verse. Hook. verse. Uh, is that really, but, you know, one, two, one, two, one, two, that's, eh, maybe. So it's not really a macro, right? It's not some mat rap macros that act like that, but not really. Um, like jazz and rhymes and riffs, how they go about their uh, ascending or with, when they're singing those types of things. Particularly if it's a, a song that's well known, if they do a, their own traditional. Mm -hmm. It happens musically, it happens in Beethoven, right? Training, training, habituation, habituation, divergence. Uh, those like key changes in songs? Mm hmm Has the same kind of effect, right? Training, 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 same, same, different, right? Similarity, similarity, divergence. Verses in Gold Digger, where like the first two are from the perspective of the guy, but then the third one flips it, and it's from the perspective of the girl. Mm -hmm. and portrays the original narrator as the villain. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's repetition. You know, the greatest, the greatest example of that is this. Yeah. <laughs> Stan. Right. Anybody aware of Stan? Anybody not aware of Stan? Anybody not, not blown away by this list? <laughs> Don't know what this means. Stan is probably Eminem's uh, greatest record, right? Arguably, hands down, probably Eminem, Eminem's greatest record, right? The song is about a fan. It's where we get the word Stan from, right? Anybody got any stands in here? <laughs> I got a couple stands. I got, I have a lot. I have a lot. I'm a stand of you. Yeah, I do. Likewise. I appreciate that. There's a stand reciprocity going on right here. Hey, stand by me. Um, the song is about a fan who writes Eminem a letter. And he's writing this letter. Dear Marshall, right? And he writes a letter in the first verse. Then he goes and he writes a letter in the third verse. And the second verse, I apologize, right? Writes another letter to Eminem. This one's a little bit more kind of aggressive, you know, a little bit more, you know, you owe me something type vibe. Then he does the third verse. Third verse isn't a letter, per se. It's a recording. And this Stan, this fan of Eminem, He's recording himself kidnapping in true Eminem fashion, this guy. Um, 
his, uh, his girlfriend and doing this weird kind of murder-suicide plot. And he's recording this thing to Eminem. And then at the end of the verse, of that third verse, he comes to the realization, like, oh, we're going to drive this car over this bridge. He's like, oh, shit, how am I going to send this out? Right? But that's not the plot twist, is it? For the, for the stands of Eminem who know, right? That's not the plot twist. But that's great. He could have stopped right there. But there's a fourth verse, right? Kind of breaks this two, this one, one, two structure, this, this uh, three, this trifecta, this tricolon. Where it's like one, one, then the twist. He does one, one, one twist. And the twist is Eminem finally receives the letter from the first verse, right? And he sits down to respond to it. He says, dear Stan, I appreciate that you got all my records, right? I'm sorry I couldn't get back to you. I was on tour. Hey, man, I hear you going through a lot. Hey, just, you know, chill out. You'll be all right. And then Eminem as he gets toward the end of the verse, he said, you know, sometimes people do crazy things. Like there was this guy who got upset and he took his car with his girlfriend and, his, and he drove it off a bridge into the water. And, it was, and Eminem has the epiphany like, oh, shit. It was you. Right? The layering and the complexity, right, of how he worked, right, that repetition break Repetition, plot, break, structure, right? Masterful, right? Taking a very simple concept that we all learned when we were kids, because we all knew chinny, chin, chin, right? So it's very, very simple macros, right, that we all can process and all have been um, privy to, but then how do we turn around and use that? in our work as rappers, right? Very basic things. Instead of trying to do a bunch of details, right? A bunch of word flips and name flips and multiple syllable blah, 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 blah. Am I rapping and tapping and hitting again? Right, right? Okay, that's cool, right? Well, why don't, can you master these basic things? And then the argument becomes, Stan is one of the highest selling records of all time in any genre of music, right? To the point where the name of the song entered into common vernacular. The power of rap, right? On par, right? On par, culturally, with E, and e equals MC squared, right? On par, right? and other kind of catchphrases from different fields, science, social sciences, archaeology, whatever you want, history, right? Stan is right there, right? Janala Forever is a song that I wrote. It's about a little girl, a true story. Her name was Janila. She was six months old. She was murdered in Chicago. She was, she was shot about six times. The gunman was trying to kill her father in retaliation for stealing a PlayStation. He didn't know that Janila was sitting on the lap. He just ran up to the car and started shooting. Missed the father, hit her six times. A six-month-old baby. Destroyed the city. Right? I was like, I need to make that a song right now. And the song was about Janila growing up, going to school, being really smart, going to school, going to med school, becoming a doctor, instead of going to work at, let's just call it, I don't know, MGH, or whatever the hospital is. Um, she goes to open up a free clinic in the neighborhood in which she grew up in. And then one day, she's in the office, she hears some gunshots outside, and then she runs outside to this van and gets this little girl, triages her, stabilizes her, till the paramedics can come, and eventually she's saved. She saves the little girl. 
she doesn't realize that she just saved herself. Right? Repetition, repetition, repetition. Pop rip. The twist, the power of that, the surprise. All surprises don't have to be good surprises. They can happen in, a, they call it valence. It could be somewhat sad, right? It doesn't have to be, but a little glimmer of hope in there. It doesn't change the situation, but it's cathartic. It helps. Yeah? Sing About Me, Kendrick Lamar. Me, to me, one of his, his greatest records. Just the, the first verse. Where he's singing about a guy, rapping about a guy who was in the streets and was involved in some violence. And he does it a different way. So I reveal, I say it, I reveal it. You know, you bet you didn't know you, didn't, you just saved yourself. Eminem reveals it with words. He says, oh, oh shit, it, it was you. Kendrick and his genius, he, he's writing a letter in the, in the person in this, as, he, as if he's this guy. And he's like, hey, if you're if I live to see your album come out, do, 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 do. You just hit a series of gunshots. Then the verse stops. The beat keeps going. So the guy, he dies. Right? If I live to see your album come out, I just want you to do, 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 do. Right? Repetition, plot, plot, break structure. In the class, we study this. Right? We'll take examples, we'll set up a theme, we'll say, okay, we're gonna talk about surprise. We're gonna talk about a very specific type of surprise and how to utilize it and execute it, and we'll use this particular frame, right? We'll start with Three Little Pigs, and then we'll end on Kendrick Lamar, right? And show you different ways to navigate and assess and then hopefully accomplish that process in your own work. And you can talk about whatever you want. You can talk about Three Little Pigs if you want, right? Just ask the Ron. You know, it's the only thing I ask, and it has to be to a beat. There's more. It's not just surprise, right? I call them primes, because I like to sound smart, mathematical. But fundamental rap primes. We just went through surprisal, and there's different ways. There's different mechanisms. There's different approaches to generate surprise, right? To navigate through it, right? To process it. The hope would be the same way that you did the acronym for rap, you do that for surprise. Right? You look at this thing, you look at this word, the single word, the single concept, and you approach it from all these different angles and ways to try and hack it. Right? Come up with new, novel, surprising ways to surprise. Right? Maybe it's do it in a group. Right? Do a little think tank. Right? Do a little something. Do, figure out different avenues to generate that. Rhyme is the another one. Metaphor, tone, and then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And we can do this all day. Right? All of those very, very fundamental, uh, very, very powerful things that we interface with on a daily basis are just kind of sitting dormant in rap, waiting to kind of be explored in a very methodical, very classical way with the goal of creating new work. Right? Not old work new work. In order to create new work, we have to advance some of these primes or rethink them in fundamental ways with the new knowledge or the new perspectives that you as a younger generation have that I don't possess. Yeah? Yeah? Cool. That is the name of the class for uh, MIT undergrads. Uh, it is also open to Harvard, Wellesley, and mass art in terms of cross-registration. So if you're interested, um, you are a student of any of those schools, you know somebody that's in any of those schools, uh, they're more than welcome to apply. That is the uh, course number, special subject, CMS S60, Rap Theory and Practice. It'll be up, on pre, it'll be up for pre-registration tomorrow, actually. Um, and then outside of this, one of the conundrums that me and Doc IT have been trying to solve 
is making sure that the community of not only Cambridge but Boston wide and beyond those are able to participate in the course and in the class in some capacity. So the syllabus will be up if you want to follow along. Uh, nine times out of 10, we will be working with OCW, which is open courseware here at MIT, um, to at least record it. There's other things that we're thinking about. And primarily, we still want to hold sessions like this. So talks that are open to the public, open, open to, the, to the grad students, open to faculty, open to, open to staff, anybody that wants to come in and kind of address and run through these in a different way. For folks that are interested in taking a class, want to have a little bit more information, you will be rapping and recording in the class. Your final project is an EP. I will fucking fail you. <laughs> right? I will. I so will fail you. My name is Fiasco, so that is a failure. And I have no problem sharing you with myself. Um, no. But I do want you to take it seriously. Um, you don't have to know how to rap. I'll teach you. Um, but you will be expected to rap, and you will have rap assignments that you have to turn in. Okay? So if you're afraid, or if that's a challenge for you, I cordially invite you. So it's a wonderful experience. I've taught this before, so I know it works. Um, but yeah, so that's just a little information on the class. If you're interested in going through some of those white papers about surprise, um, this is the, uh, uh, it's a body of papers called The Ubiquity of Surprise, Developments in Theory, Converging Evidence, and Implications for Cognition. And it goes from computational, like actual computer science, all the way to cognitive theory. It's a basic, more, even more kind of theories and applications, a way to approach surprise. And it's in a journal called Topics, um, which is Topics in Cognitive Science. And it's on online, Wiley, Wiley Library, for those who are kind of astute. But you, you be able to, if you're looking for it, that is the, uh, the bundle of papers if you want to continue on. Yes! <laughs> there is an Ur tournament. I, uh, I play Ur. There's a few other people who play Ur in this room. Maybe you don't know what Ur is, but now is your time to do the thing with the phone. Maybe, maybe you'll pick it up. Maybe not. Or you can go to playur.org. Um, it's something that we started here at MIT not too long ago, the Societe Internationale de Ur. It is the governing body, the only governing body for Ur in the world. I did it when I was finishing my syllabus because I got bored. Um, and now we're throwing our first tournament um, at the BSU, the Black Student Union, in uh, Walker. And it is uh, Friday, 5 o'clock. It is $10 to register, um, but there are sponsored slots for the Brokey Brokes. Um, <laughs> And there's a $250 first prize. So come have some fun with us. There'll be staff there. There'll be students there. It's, it's a great. We've been playing for a couple, like a month. So if you're interested, um, there's that. And then thank you. Appreciate your time coming out in the weather and the rain. And I hope it added value. And uh, we'll leave the balance of the time for questions or insights or follow-ups or hate mail, which I also <laughs> will take. Confrontations, fights. You want to throw hands? I'm here for that. Um, but yeah, so appreciate you all. Hope it uh, added value. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, I'm back as the Q&A bouncer and want to direct your attention to the two microphones we have set up. Please come to uh, one of these. If you have a question, uh, Mr. Fiasco over here will be glad to address it. Absolutely. And there's uh, two mics down here if you want to pull up. This is your chance. Yeah. All right. What made you write the song, Hip Hop Save My Life? Mm. I mean, because it did. Um, a lot of my friends are dead. Um, so 
I mean, it did, you know. Um, I'm, I'm sure that I would have survived, you know, but it, it preserved the life that I wanted to lead, right? Because there's multiple lives. We, leave every, we lead a different life every day, multiple lives in a day, right? But which life do you want to lead the most? You know, and hip hop gave me the tools um, and the opportunities, proof is in the pudding, um, to live the life that I wanted to live. Yeah? Um, hip hop also kills a lot. You know, so there's this weird dichotomy and this balance that we're trying to do. The song itself was, was a, a homage to uh, Houston, Texas, though, to the rap, to the, to the scene the hip hop scene in Houston, Texas, um, which I was a huge fan of, a huge fan of the, uh, the artist. It's actually kind of loosely based on the life of Slim Thug. Um, and if you see the video, you see like Bum B in there, you see a few other cats from Houston in there. Um, and yeah, it was, it's, a, it's an homage to that scene. I thought they were superheroes. Like when you look at Houston rappers, and they mouths all iced out, the, the swag, the whole, I was like, oh, these dudes like Paul Wall and all those guys. So it was an homage to them. But the, the message overall was, you know, it does save lives if you let it, you know, if you wanted to. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you, Lupe, for being here and, one, sharing your art throughout the years. Really appreciate it. Um, my question is actually regarding just your philosophy for learning. Um, I spent a lot of time listening to your podcast uh, during uh, the pandemic, and uh, one thing I really appreciated was hearing how you talked about your father and how he knew just a lot about everything. And I think as someone like you, you know a lot about everything as well too. So I was just curious to hear about your philosophy for learning and how you approach new things uh, each day. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I love learning, man. You know, I love it. Um, we have nothing else to do, you know. Um, part of it is everything materially that I've ever wanted, I had, you know. Um, everything experientially to a degree, I've experienced. Um, um, and that's not to like, like humble flex or anything like that, but it's like I've all, the only thing left was to learn, you know? So I, I come to school every day. I, I don't go to college, right? So this is my freshman year, and I'm treating it like my freshman year at MIT, right? And so I just go to my office every day and read white papers, you know? And people come by and they drop off books. And they say, hey, do you want to go to the lab? And I'm in there just like a freshman, just in there doing transformations and pipetting shit and, and reading through kind of historical monographs and all type of other craziness. And I've been doing that since I was a kid. I've been reading this like when I, my, my sister's legend about me is that uh, I used to just read the encyclopedia, you know? Um, and I think even just through rap, I wanted to, I, I want to talk about other things. I don't want to talk about the same old rigmarole. I want to talk about different things, novel things, surprising things. And that requires kind of extending yourself, opening yourself up to other conversations, right? To other knowledge bases, to other ideologies, even if you disagree with them, right? And I look at my track record, and I've made records about nuclear weapons. I've made records about Houston, Texas. I've made records about skateboarding. I've made records, anything that I could, you know, that, that spoke to me, I pursued and pursued it deeply, right? And even me being at MIT, part of this is like, yeah, I'm gonna teach some of the things that I know, but I'm really here learning more than I'm teaching, you know, because I want to get deeper into, you know, surprise, you know? I want to get deeper into rhyme, I want to get deeper into rhythm, I want to get deeper into other things. So I'm just constantly learning. Never stop learning, right? Because you don't have a choice. That's the real thing, you're always gonna learn. So you might as well be very intentional about the things that you want to learn and then be very intentional about how you want to operationalize and cement those learnings um, in your own life. Yeah? So. Mm -hmm. Which idea did you have first? The song The Cool or the album The Cool? And what was your inspiration behind it? Um, the Cool started out, my mentor is Cornell West, uh, Dr. Cornell West, and him... Tavis Smiley, I want to say uh, Dr. Dyson, Michael Eric Dyson as well, uh, they were doing like this speaking tour kind of randomly, right? Um, and I, I don't know if it was part of like the this, this state of black America. It was something like this very just interesting. They would go to these theaters in different cities, and they would just sit up there and, and be smart, right? Um, 
And Cornel West said, we have to find a way to make the things that are harmful uncool and make the things that you know, are good cool. And it was like, bing, I got gotcha. you. Right? Um, and that became the, the, the initial point, right? A command was given by one of the elders you know, to the artistic class who spoke to the youth with a mission to make those things uncool. And I went, right? And then the whole process, you may have seen some of it play out here, the whole process of, okay, what do we do? What is the most immortal story that persists through all culture, right? What is that trope that just never dies? Zombies, right? Thriller is one of the biggest records in the world. And I was like, oh, zombies. Oh, yeah, zombies. Right? So I'm going to turn the cool shit into a zombie. Rotting flesh, you know, like all of those trappings. But I'm going to do it through a frame so that it sticks and it stays. Right? And it's my, it's my most popular album. It's my highest selling album. Right? And so there's something to that. Oh, yeah being very intentional about that work and how you do it. Um, and then it was just putting other pieces to it, building out the storyline with the streets and the game and putting them in the narrative and having them play against each other and creating these different ideologies and then pulling in these different concepts of the cool. A, a lot of it was uh, Miles Davis, the birth of the cool. So it was like, he did the birth of the cool. I'm going to do the death of the cool. I can die, right? Um, so a lot of those decisions were very intentional to speak to history, so that when questions are asked like that, I can say, oh, there was a little influence from Miles Davis, Birth of the Cool. Have you ever heard that album? Have you? I yeah, now you're going to hear it now. <laughs> yeah? So, indeed, indeed, right? Learning moments to help build into your own craft, right? But if you don't have that type of intentionality with how you learn and how you operationalize the things you learn, then you won't be able to pass those things along. Right? Hmm? Hmm. What's up, Ian? Mr. Professor Condry? Great talk. Thank you so much for tonight. Um, yeah, so about surprise. Uh, you know, one thing so interesting about it is it, it keeps changing, right? There's no, the old surprise. I was thinking, you know, back in the day, breakdancing. Look, he's spinning on his head. And now it's like, oh, yeah, it's breakdancing. And look, he's scratching a record. Oh, my God, what's that? And then it's like, oh, yeah, he's scratching a record. Uh, are there things that you've noticed lately in sort of how hip hop's evolving and say, oh yeah, I thought there was nowhere to go, but now this surprised me, or, <laughs> or because we're already used to all this other stuff. Like, uh, for you, what, what's a new frontier for surprise? Um, devolving, right? There's a de-evolution taking place, right? Um, and that's surprising, because hip hop was all about evolution. Right? It was all about multiple forms. And that still exists, and I don't want to take away from that, but it's devolving content-wise. Or if, if it's not devolving to that degree, it's super adapted to the point where it has no other place to go, and it's starting to become complacent, and it's setting itself up to get overthrown, and that is surprising. And so what I look for is what is the thing that's coming next to disco hip hop, right? Right? Punk got disco out of there a little bit. Then like rock and roll and hip hop kind of got punk out of there. Now hip hop is doing and rap is doing some of the same things that those genres, which are still there, but they're there calcified, right? And they're kind of being pulled from maybe an electronic music or this, that, and the third, but as a, as a genre leading type thing or a genre in and of itself where people are still, Giorgio Moroder is like, I mean, he did the Daft Punk piece, but it's like, maybe that counts, but it's not everywhere, right? But maybe it is. We'll have that conversation later, right? Um, but I feel like that's what's happening, right? I feel like there's, there's a paradigm shift that's about to happen and that some of that ultraviolence, right? is contributing not only to the death of the artists themselves, but to the death of the genre, right? Because um, it's, it's it used to be surprising to hear somebody say, 
um, I'm going to kill such and such, right? I was like, whoa, my God. He said, you're just going to kill such and such. Did you hear that? <laughs> Cut that music off, boy. <laughs> now, that is, there is no alternative. And you can't cut the music off, right? Can't be that stopgap. It's too, it's too democratic. So anyway, that's what I think is it, it is. But in terms of rap itself, I really, as you know, I really enjoy Japanese hip hop. Um, it's always interesting to see the new artists that come out of these places where you don't expect it. I, I expect it because I know the history, but it's still interesting to see how they're taking the forms that are coming out in the new generations and then processing it. Right? And then giving their kind of cultural spin on it. So, yeah. Appreciate you. Yo! What's going on, boss? Appreciate you um, for, the, for the night. Um, so I got two questions. The first one is really light. It's, um, it's more so about the class. Like, what's the process for a, a Tufts student, particularly a Tufts graduate student, if they wanted to, to register for this class? And then the second one is, um, in light of what you've, what you've kind of discussed, it, it kind of like sheds light on the the morphing um, or the appreciation of, of rap as an art and a science. Mm. So what's, what's your process for writing, particularly in periods where you, you might have a, like a, um, a block of some sort um, in, in your writing? Um, I don't believe there's a such thing as writer's block. Um, there's some, we've had some interesting conversations in Sosa about that. Um, it's very, very interesting kind of like there's a physical thing that is supposed to represent writers. It's very interesting. But anyway, um, I don't believe in writer's block. Um, I believe that like, there's some times where you just shouldn't write. I do believe that. Like, put the pen down, my guy. You know, go experience. Maybe you take that as a signal for you need new experiences. Right? Um, I, don't believe, I don't necessarily believe in writer's block because I have such a fascination with the base of word. Right? Maybe this is a lesson for you. Um, if you're experiencing writer's block, maybe there's something to you asking that question because you, you got writer's block, right? Um, like, I fell in love with words, you know? In the same way where you can go back and analyze and assess just stretching vowels in the same word, very basic things, and pull out new meanings, if not new semantic meanings, new kind of structural kind of presentations or new sonic ideas that come out of that, you know? Um, and just, just work with the material that's there until something comes up of interest, right? That's not necessarily a block, like you're working, right? If, if, if that's what you're doing, right? If you're just kind of like keep trying to throw bars and gather all these punchlines and be as witty as you can and you're coming up with weak ass punchlines, um, there are a bunch of weak ass punchlines, you know? I come up with silly, dumb punchlines like, nope, no, 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 no. Oh, um, but then I also come up with a little fire thing here and there. But a majority come up with is concepts and a ways to approach a particular concept, as opposed to like I need this bar to be dope because I want to sound like I'm on URL with every verse. And it's like nah, you know, just enjoy words. You know, enjoy the feeling that you get when you have a novel idea and you get that cascade of dopamine and it's like oh, lovely, right? So you got it. Boo yeah, what's up, brother? Hey, what's up, Lupe? Uh, firstly, thank you for coming, huge fan. Um, so I was going to ask you two questions. The first question was just asked um, in regards to how do you approach writing? Mm. Um, you know, do you come in with a freestyle? But you just talked about that. So I'll go on to my second question, which was, what's your perspective on redrafting something you've already written or perhaps something you've already recorded? Um. I mean, I draft in real time. I edit in real time, right? So as I'm writing, I'm editing, right? Um, and there's some things that I won't, depending on what, the, 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 what I'm writing for, right? If I'm just writing for the joy of writing, then that, you don't edit because you're writing for whatever comes out and you're writing things that feel good to you, right? Um, if I'm writing to sell some records, it'll be different. Right? If I'm writing to go into a battle, it would be different. If I'm writing to go into this, it would be different. Um, there is something to approaching things very systematically. right? If you have all of this kind of nascent knowledge 
there, right? If you're coming in within, you've been practicing very intentional things, right? And then you can kind of suspend. There was a, there was a great uh, uh, jazz player by the name of Bill Evans, right? Jazz pianist, right? And he says, well, you learn all of this kind of classical training and all these different chord structures, and you learn all this static you know, kind of stuff and very, very academic, and you, you, you go through these standards and standards and standards and standards and standards, standards. So these things become innate. And once they become innate, you can then collapse all that, and then you can create right, freely. But you're creating from a space of education. You know, you're creating from a space of knowledge as opposed to creating just pure virtuosity. Right? And so that idea of build up your basic skill sets, right? if you build these muscles, then no matter what you do, right, you'll, be, you'll already have edited. Your, your synapses would have already kind of built in certain ways where it's just been like, oh, we only do this. So if you build yourself just to dope, because you can do that. You can build yourself to just do punchlines, right? And at the expense of what, though, right? But you can do that. You can, build your, you can build a certain schema set that only makes this type of writing or that type of writing. Um, but sometimes I do freestyle it out, too. Right? There, is a, there is something to just top lining. I'm going to get in the back of this place and show everybody what I can do with my face. I'm going to smile, I'm going to style, and hold down the aisle, and everybody. Maybe I'm going to move into the south. Maybe I'm going to go into Atlanta. Maybe I'm going to hit them with the cameras and scanners and Anna's, right? So that's just like, got this top line. Just, which is just these words, but a feel, and then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna find the words that match that. But if your vocabulary is this big, you're not gonna be able to do that. Right? So focus on the basics. Mastery of the basics is mastery, period. Right? Thank you. You got it. Yo! Salam alaikum, Lupe. Peace. Uh, thank you for doing this. I'm not an MIT student, I'm studying film at Emerson, so. The fact that it's open to public is really cool of you. So thank you. Um, I have another writing question. I think we got a lot of writers in here, but uh, all of your albums and songs uh, feel like you build a world and then fill it with your ideas and thoughts. Mm -hmm. So do you build a world and then uh, go from there and develop an album through that, or do you do it retroactively? Do you have uh, specific song ideas and individual ideas you want to express to people and then build a world going backwards from there? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're always going to build a world, right? You're never not building a world, right? Or borrowing a world, right? And maybe recolonizing different parts of that world, right? Rarely do I hear somebody building a world from scratch. I hear a lot of borrowing of worlds or invading of other worlds, right? Um, so be, be cognizant of that. Um, but with that said, as just kind of like a general framework, like. Yeah, you, I, I start with a word that sounds good, right? Like paper tiger, right? And I'm like, oh shit, paper tiger. Mm, origami, mm, origami, that's Japan. Oh, but that's also these sharp edges. Ooh, okay, what else has sharp edges? Maybe that Radiohead album cover for Kid A Amnesia. Oh, then you start to populate just off that one word, right? But you want to start with something very strong, very visible. But also maybe something very mysterious. So it can become a surprising moment for somebody once you unfold that tiger and you realize it's the note that Eminem was writing back to Stan. Right? And he didn't know what to do with it, so he folded it into a paper tiger and he put it on a thing. And it's like, oh shit, that's fucking crazy. Little baby Knight, all the songs in the talk together. That's all wow. Right? Um, so sometimes you build a world, sometimes you borrow somebody else's world. Like how I just borrowed Stan's world. Right? But now I incorporated this idea into it to point it toward this culture so now we can have this type of conversation. Right? But that other world is still here. So instead of building a world, let's build a universe. Right? Let's build a system. Right? And that's kind of where I am. I want to build systems, interconnected things. Um, but it also depends on what the, the project is. Drew Music is I on. I need to record an album in 24 hours from scratch. Right? The first record is going to decide. Or here's the title. Cool. 
It's a little vague, but it sounds good, right? But it's from the Matrix. So if anything happens, we always got the Matrix, right? If anything happens, that's from the Matrix. Loopy, I don't understand what this means. Is this like Pac-Man or something like this? Like, it's from the Matrix. They're like, ah, it's from the Matrix, right? Um, and then you'd start to just, it's a time thing. It's not even about what I want to do. It's what I have to do if I'm going to meet this, this time limit, right? Kind of like this talk. Um, but yeah, so it's, it, it depends on what I'm trying to do at that time. Some, some records take a very long time. I'm still writing this record called Samurai, right? Which is the life of Amy Winehouse as a battle rapper, right? It's like, holy shit, right? But it's like, <laughs> right? Um, so it's, 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 it's a lot of different things, a lot of different ways to go. But do you understand all of them? Can you do all of them, right? As opposed to being aware of them. And then how many different paths do you have at your disposal? That's more important, right? Having multiple paths. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hey, salut. My name's Chris. What's up, Chris? Uh, first off, like, thank you, because uh, uh, Food and Liquor is the first album, or what in my household was the first secular album I bought. Oh, wow. And, thank you. Yeah, and uh, it made me widen my perspective on what I perceived to be true. It made me look into a wider scope. Mm. And uh, so I thank you for that, for mm. sure, because I learned from Abu Ghraib to from uh, uh, Gold Watch, everything that was on Gold Watch, from learning about what Heist in the Body was to... Hype Beast, just looking up the websites. So I appreciate you for that. Oh, you got it, you got it. But uh, question I got is because, so I remember you did Japanese cartoon. Mm. And I remember Hello Goodbye had a real punk feel to it. Mm. And how early on did bands like, uh, I assume Joy, Div Joy Division was one of your inspirations? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Queen, uh, how early on did that inspire you and in, in, like, affect your writing? Mm. Um, punk music is always just aesthetically. We good. Okay. They're not going to turn the lights off, but our audio visual support will bounce ends in six minutes. Six, okay. So uh, we want to see if we can get to as many questions as possible, maybe about the shapes. Indeed. Rather than the details. Dev and details. See how you use that against me? <laughs> did you catch that? You see how you did that? I've always been a fan of punk from a performative aspect to an aesthetic aspect, right? The energy of it, the vibe. I based my live shows, if not the music. You know, punk, Japanese cartoon is my punk. I have a punk band called Japanese Cartoon where I sing in a British accent, and it's fucking hilarious. Um, but more for the performative aspect. So my stage shows, a lot of that is pulled from Bad Brains and NERD and, you know, punk and Ian Curtis and like stuff like that, right? Um, how they performed minimally without a lot of shit and we're still able to put on an energetic show and what does that take, right? So that's kind of like the cue for that um, and what I kind of pulled from that genre in a direct way that you can see, right? Like when I'm on stage wilding the fuck out. Yeah, cool. Yo, we're gonna, we're gonna cycle through these things. We're gonna get, we're gonna get shapes, you know? Good evening and Good evening. thank you. Maybe I can keep mine brief with an invitation. Ah. Uh, you mentioned earlier how you can get more of this out there. I am a public school teacher hey. just across the other side of Mass Ave in Arlington. So you can come on over anytime. Um, because I, what I was going to ask is both for the kids and for the teachers, definitely and especially the district in which I work, this is probably not the type of literature that is embraced. So I'm wondering how to maybe get more teachers to kind of uh, cultivate this different type of poetry in their classroom. And also for the young kids that are dreaming of this being the next Lupe Fiasco who have no time to pay attention to my English class, <laughs> um, what message would you give them? Um, the message I would give to your English class directly is uh, I'm, without 1984, the book 1984, which I got in my English class, right? There is no Lupe Fiasco, right? Arguably, right? Because it was like, oh, you can tell a story like this and it has double think, D this concept of double think, and in the end, at the back of, of, uh, of 1984, there's a whole dictionary which defines like all the words that they were using in the book, and it was like a whole like weird like breakdown of it. I was like, oh my God, double think. I'll two ideas. 
operating at the same time. Oh man, these bars, punchlines, metaphors. Um, I need to have multiple, uh, triple entendres, double entendres when I write raps. So it became a teaching moment, right? So it was, but I had to do that, right? Nobody, nobody said that. Now that you know, you can see like, what are you interested in? My greatest teacher, his name was Mr. Kendrick, Mr. K, rest in peace. It was like, fuck all this, right? I'm going to just give you this D so you can pass, so you can focus on what you want to do, right? And I'm just here to empower and surround what you already are good at and what you want to do. So take this stuff, right? And then how can we apply it to what you already do? And it's meeting them where they are, right? And then for, at least for me, humbly, I would say. So just tell them, like, hey, man, you can rap about this, right? Because Lupe Fiasco said so. Um, appreciate Thank you. But you. I, will pay, I will pay a visit, yeah? Absolutely. I will email you. Next for sure. <laughs> Hi, Lou. Um, so I have a question. You mentioned the repetition break technique, and you listed three songs, but I'm curious if I have the wrong idea about that, because the first thing that came in my mind is he say, she say, and the cool, um, because he comes back from the dead, goes back to the people that killed him. I was wondering why that wasn't listed, or if I just have the wrong concept. Sometimes I forget my own songs. <laughs> <laughs> And I was trying to find the most obvious examples. Oh, okay. Um, and, and, and that's why. But you're correct. You're correct. Oh, that that frame thing. is there. Sometimes it's there unconsciously, you know, because that's just we were taught to tell stories in a certain way, and we reference the stories that we know the most and are the most simple, right? So, but you're, you're correct. It is in the cool. It's in, it's in other songs as well, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes it's reversed, right? It's about, oh, how do we reverse that process where we actually start with the reveal, and then it becomes educate you after the fact, and then... You're like, oh shit, that was a giant robot, right? Kind of deal. So, okay. yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Mars. Yo. Hello, Lupe. Nice to see you again. Nice seeing you. Um, so, I'll keep my question short. How do you think that we, like MIT students, like scientists, physicists, engineers, like what can we contribute to the rap scene or to the hip hop music or the culture? Say that again, the first like, part. Oh, what, what part? <laughs> like everything? Okay. So, <laughs> Uh, what do you think that, say, us, like MIT students, like physicists, engineers, uh, mathematicians, what can we contribute to? Oh, oh, wow, yeah. wow. So one of the best rappers at MIT right now is a nuclear physicist. Brincino? His name is Alex. Okay. All he raps about is nuclear physics. <laughs> right? And I'm put him on blast. He came to me. He's a grad student. He went to Caltech and then came here for, for grad student. Um, all he, right, Doc Ati? All he raps about, all of his raps are about nuclear physics, right? And he gets, oh my God, right? But they're really fucking good. And he can perform them at length. He came and did a five minute thing, just kind of like, and I'm learning and excited and dancing and going crazy. And I was like, oh my God, right? So. It's how you approach it. Do you want to use it as a, turning, as a learning tool? Do you want to you know, think about it? And do you want to come up with a mathematic, mathematical formula that represents this? Because the other part of these, these uh, papers is there is a mathematical formula for a surprise. Right? It's like, here's this delta sigma thingy with a zoop de zoop and a ba -de -ba, right? And that's how surprise look if it was a mathematical equation. Right? And that exists for everything. So maybe the support would be like, hey, take a look at what we do. The same way that you look at nanoparticles, right? And what do you see? And then come and have, come be in concert with us and come conversate with the rappers, right? And then we can give you what we see in you and in your field and how we can say, hey, you know, if you talked about it this way or maybe if you approached it this way, you know, maybe people would get it, right? Instead of saying, like, you, what, what's, what's the thing? Uh, you know, in, in calculus, right? Just say a little bit of, right? Just say a little bit of. Like this dx over the, the that's just saying a little bit of this and a little bit of that. <laughs> right? Um, got, cool? Cool? You good? All right, cool. Thank you. Bye.
So gotta, I tell you, this is going to have to be our last question. But before we take it, uh, you noticed that we, you could hear everything yes. that we were saying. So let's let's give it up Round for the people in the booth. Audio visual made guy. that possible. Right. I'll have this one more. Yeah. yeah. Hi, um, I'm the daughter of two professors over here. Hey. Um, <laughs> so that's why I'm here. Um, I was wondering. I think you had an interesting point about like how the current state of RAF is like you know coming home devolving. There's like a lot of. Speak up again. I'm sorry. I think you made like a really interesting point about how a lot of like current RAF is sort of like devolving. Like there's a lot of violence, etc. I was wondering if there are any newer like rappers that you feel like bring something new to the game and have been like interesting you. Uh, new rappers. Um, I mean, Alex here at MIT who raps about nuclear physics. I mean, like, oh my God, right? <laughs> like, he's ridiculous and amazing and, and phenomenal. And he's like running a particle accelerator right now somewhere and <laughs> writing raps about this shit. And I'm like, oh my God, right? When I, when I, when I, when I look at rap, and, I, and this is something that's going to be relevant in the class, right? Is there's rap music, business rap, and Billboard, and the charts, and Spotify, and all these other things. That is this much of rap. It is very, very tiny reflection of what rap is, and who's doing rap, and where. And I try and be tuned into all of it. Right? And when you tune into all of it, even though that that piece, the violence is there, and we can't shy away from that, right? All of the other things are there, the ills are there. Um, but there's also a lot of not. You know, I meet a guy who everything he raps about is nuclear physics. I meet another guy, everything, and he doesn't even curse. D1 doesn't even curse his, his raps at all, which is wild to me. You should curse, man. <laughs> Listen, it's delicious, baby. Uh. <laughs> um, so that's a range, and I don't want to pigeonhole, and I also don't want to just point out or, or limit you to think that what's available on Spotify, on the playlist, is the only thing that you have, and the only thing you have access to, right? Some of the best rap that you're ever going to hear is the rap that you go out and find and discover, that you go out when they're doing an open mic at the Middle East, or they're doing a thing over at what have you, you know? or Cambridge Cypher is doing something or something like that, right? Like, that's where you're going to see these moments in a context that will really speak to you, right? Because there's something, yeah, you can listen to it in the iPod, and you can listen to it in this, and listen to it in that, or whatever. But there's something about discovering some random guy, you know, freestyling on a corner, you know? And it's just, wow, the way he incorporated, or she, or, or they, or them, or whomever, incorporated this little thing, and it was like, wow. That was, that was really good. That's rap, and it counts, and it's, va and it's valid, right? So yeah, and buy more Lupe Fiasco albums. He's great. I hear he's, <laughs> I hear, I hear that guy's really good. You know, maybe, maybe not. We'll see. But yeah, good. Thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate the question. Um, I'll wrap up, Doc. I do want to highlight uh, my brother D1 here. Uh, stand up, D. Um, It, it's, it's, uh, what is it, serendipity? Or like, it was meant to, what's that word? Yeah, serendipity. It was serendipitous? Yep. That's good, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, how we arrived here in Cambridge on the same plane, in the, not on the same airplane, but in the same time frame with the same mission. So while I'm here at MIT doing this, uh, my brother D1 is a, uh, is a uh, Nas fellow down at Harvard. Wow. Um, at the uh, 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 African American Institute, right? Um, with uh, Skip Gates and the other folks that are there, P Professor Morgan. And so he'll be here for the year, just like I'll be here for the year. Hopefully we'll be here longer than a year. Maybe, right, D? Maybe they, hey, you know, hey, hey, you know. Um, <laughs> but D is down there doing amazing work, researching uh, the relationship between hip hop and violence, hip hop and divinity. Um, all these interesting layers and chambers um, that are, are of interest to him and doing it at, 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 at the highest levels at some of the highest and greatest institutions um, that, that America has to offer. So two boys who have been welcomed into the Cambridge, Cambridge family from our respective cities. Dee is from New Orleans, from Chicago. Um, 
on that same mission to kind of show hip hop in a different way, to show rap music in a different way and expose it to you in a different way. So just want to give you your flowers. Um, and he just released a record called God and Girls 2, um, which he released not on streams, to your point, right? Yeah. It's not on streams, right? You go to his website, it's, you can download it for free or you can pay $5,000 for it because he's a... <laughs> <laughs> stop it, stop lying, man, stop lying. Thank you, brother. Name, name your own price. And then he's also doing more things at Harvard next semester and stuff like that. So make sure you tune in to my brother, uh, D1. Um, so yeah. Uh, lastly, thank you. Again, audiovisual, thank you guys um, for hanging in there for us. We appreciate it. Thanks to the staff here at MIT. Thanks to all the faculty for showing up. Really appreciate you. Um, and we'll see you all next. We'll see you all uh, Friday at the ER tournament over at Walker, pull up. But we'll see you next time. Hopefully we'll have another symposium like this. And if you see, if for the students, for the students that are here, I have office hours all the time. I'm in building 14 on the fourth floor. So if you want to come kick the shit, you want to come play ER, you want to come play some of your music for me, you want to come talk about nuclear physics, give me a book or anything like that, I'm available at service to you here as long as my tenure lasts, okay? So appreciate y'all. Enjoy the, uh, the evening. Try not to get wet. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.